Hello, my name is Dr. Tim McClanahan. I work with the Wildlife Conservation Society. I've been active in the Indian Ocean for the last 35 years or so. And I'm grateful to Aranjit and Vikash for organizing this workshop and being able to present the first hour of this uh, introduction to coral reefs. Um, I've been working on coral reefs for quite some time in the Indian Ocean and Mauritius. I first came here in 2001 and began collecting field data in 2004 uh, with the help of Ruby within Palais. And uh, I have a keen interest in a number of the issues in Mauritius, and I'll give you a, some idea of that interest and the overview, and particularly the context uh, in the Western Indian Ocean. I'd like to, like to talk about three uh, challenges that most coral reefs face, and those particularly in Mauritius, and that's climate change, sustainable fishing, and protecting biodiversity and endemics. All of these are, are infecting Mauritius in various ways, and I hope to give you some context to what sort of the state of, of sciences in each of these topics. I'll have to be brief on each of the topics to cover all of them, but I think that um, if you listen carefully, you'll learn a lot about uh, the current state of coral reef conservation science on each of these three topics. Climate change in coral reefs is largely s synonymous with coral bleaching. This is a loss of color in corals, often due to the breakdown of the symbiotic relationship between corals and algae. The small microalgae leave under heat and light stress, and what you're seeing is the underlying coral skeleton. This is generally believed to occur uh, when temperatures exceed a certain threshold, often one degree centigrade above the mean summer maximum. Uh, but it can be greatly modified by uh, chronic stresses in the background conditions and by the um, other water quality and other variables during that time of the heat stress. Um, in, it tends to be considered a global phenomenon with fairly uniform responses across taxa and geography. But my argument is that uh, that's an overly simplistic view of bleaching and that in many cases it depends a great deal on the tax of corals, but also specifically on the chronic stresses uh, that corals are exposed to. So in order to uh, give you some idea about that variability, I've plotted the sea surface temperature variability metrics in the Western Indian Ocean here, so that you can get some idea of how these things vary. And you can see here that there are six different um, categories or class groups of sea surface temperature. Um, each of them has a slightly unique difference in the chronic and acute stresses. And um, this is, in my opinion, will greatly influence the outcomes of, of, of climate change because there will be certain adaptations or acclimation conditions within the corals within each of these sea surface temperature regions and that will affect the outcome. So what you're seeing in the top graph is a plot of those six um, categories of temperature for this region in which I, you can see the distribution among some of the variability metrics such as the standard deviations by, by, by modality, the cumulative amount of excess heat, uh, skewness, and kurtosis. If you look at Mauritius in particular, you'll see that Mauritius is in cluster four, and it's, it's um, it, the properties of high, high variation and sea surface temperature are there. That's expected from uh, its uh, temperate position. Uh, also high bimodality, that would be the seasonality, uh, pretty high accumulative degree heating weeks, um, which means that it is getting exposed to thermal stresses uh, above the mean summer temperature. But they all have some, some other factors such as um, a, a moderate temperature rise, but some temperature distribution metrics such as um, kurtosis and skewness that may greatly influence the outcomes as I'll show later. In general, Mauritius has uh, somewhat flat distributions, that means it has thick, thick tails, 
and that gives its corals a certain amount of acclimation to stress. It, um, it is not strong, there's not strong skew in the temperature and also that, that often means the acute stresses may not be that extreme in this environment. So when you look at climate change, as I'll show later, these context specific conditions can be quite important for the outcomes. Uh, coral reef bleaching is a relatively new science. It's a young field of science, and so like many young fields of science, there's uh, periods of discovery that are, are going on before about 1998 when bleaching was not observed very frequent, frequently. It was sort of an oddity, and in many cases people were asking, what is this bleaching? And they had to study the algae and the corals and figure out that it was this breakdown of the coral bleaching, uh, it's the breakdown of the symbiosis that I mentioned before. And so during that stage it was just simply a descriptive science trying to understand what was um, going on when corals were exposed to some sort of extreme conditions that may, often was extreme warm water or it could be also even extreme cold water, but this was a mechanism by which uh, corals responded and there was a there's an ongoing debate as to whether this is adaptive or just simply a, a measure of dysfunction in coral reefs and that debate is still ongoing in many ways. Uh, after some time there was some theory to develop um, what, what caused uh, coral bleaching, what were the conditions that uh, created it. And many the early studies often um, used a, a model that I call the threshold model. That is above a certain unusually warm water level, often about one degree centigrade above the summer baseline, corals began to bleach, and that bleaching resulted in, in, in unhealthy corals, diseases, and mortality. So the threshold model was one of the earliest models, um, and in, today it's still a very popular model, um, but later uh, people began to make more measurements about different types of uh, temperature patterns, the distributions of temperatures, other modifying variables like light, uh, water quality, um, you know, currents, um, a number of factors, and that became uh, more the examination of more variables in what I often call uh, variability models, that is that um, the interactions between chronic and acute stress often were what caused this bleaching. And in this, up until fairly recently, these two uh, views of coral reefs have been working somewhat independently of each other. They often um, take, uh, share some of the same metrics, but uh, they have uh, different types of assumptions about this um, phenomenon. And I think more recently, particularly since about the 2016 or 2018 when papers were published, we're seeing more sort of testing and modification of these two theories uh, in, uh, in many cases as the, the data accumulates and there's bleaching surveys done on very broad scales at this point. Here I'm showing you a timeline of studies of some of the variables that people have looked at uh, over the past um, 30 some years. Um, and you can see that uh, some of the degree heating weeks or the excess thermal stress metrics were very popular in the beginning. And as we proceed forward with the science, we're beginning to see more modifying variables being added um, to, to this study. Uh, these include various things like the geography, the longitude and latitude, um, and ecoregions and provinces, and many of these studies are finding these are our significant patterns in, in the bleaching response. Uh, more recently, they're looking at human influences and, um, and um, uh, environmental modifying vari variables, habitats, but in general, these are smaller contributions to the analysis of the bleaching response. They, as, as I said before, as studies accumulate more uh, observations, they're also able to access more data, usually from satellites, and use that satellite information to evaluate the importance of these variables. So in this particular case of studying 114 journal articles, you find 58 variables being examined, but some of them are often dominant and repeated over time.
one of the reasons we're interested in understanding the factors that cause bleaching is because we're trying to find sanctuaries, areas that corals are not experiencing stress, or if they are experiencing stress, they are somehow adapting to that stress in order that they survive into the future. So from the conservation point of view, the search for sanctuaries is a core part of what we do these days. So one of the things I'm asking myself is, are there sanctuaries in the Western Indian Ocean? Where are they located and what can we do about them? But in order to do that, you have to realize that there are basically three types of sanctuaries. There's not a single type of sanctuary, but there are avoidance sanctuaries. These are areas that just manage to avoid any stressful conditions. There are resistance sanctuaries. These are animals in these environments that for whatever reason have resistance to thermal stresses. And there are recovery sanctuaries. These are areas that once they are disturbed, they can eventually recover due to the conditions that promote recovery in these areas. So understanding where these sanctuaries are, it's clear that you need to define each of these three types of sanctuaries in order to understand what might be uh, the best locations to work at. Clearly avoidance sanctuaries are often where people focus the most. Um, and uh, there are a number of those identified, but as I'll show later, uh, depending on how you define your sanctuary in terms of the metrics you use, you could come up with very different locations as sanctuaries, and that becomes important as we try and prioritize where to work. Um, just to give you an idea of uh, the diversity of, uh, of approaches, I've, um, again, used a multivariate analysis to evaluate these uh, 114 papers and how they're distributed in terms of the types of uh, variables they look at, whether it's excess thermal stress or modifying variables, geography, coral, benthic cover, habitats, or human influences, and then my definition of them as either a threshold or a variability uh, model of analysis. And what you can see is that many of the threshold um, model, there's many threshold models and many of them are on the left of this diagram indicating that they're not looking at a large number of variables typically. The variability models are to the right and then you can see some of them are look, use uh, different numbers of variables um, for each of those types of um, uh, categories of, of, of stress or modifying stress. So that, that now allows us to maybe define our sanctuaries a little bit better as well. That uh, threshold models, uh, sanctuaries are generally be areas that avoid these thermal stresses, whereas um, these variability models may indicate areas that have more modifying environments, things that may give them some uh, resistance to thermal stress or possibly even the potential for recovery. So you can see now that we're sort of dividing our, our metrics into those that might provide different types of sanctuary uh, among those three types. Uh, typically avoidance would be a property of the threshold models and environmental availability would be more typical of the resistance and the recovery models. So one of the things that I've done is I've looked at the papers that have identified sanctuaries. There are about 35 pa papers um, that identify sanctuaries and uh, they each use slightly different methodologies, some thresholds, some uh, variability type thresholds, and then I plotted them uh, in space in terms of the types of models they have. And, and each of these colored areas here is an example of a specific type of model trying to identify a sanctuary. And what you can see is most of the region could be considered a sanctuary depending on how you, what metrics you use and how you define your your sanctuary. So in many cases, uh, this has been useful work, but what it identifies is the fact that um, we can end up with very different results depending on, on the, uh, the types of metrics we use. And therefore, it becomes important to distinguish between these uh, many alternatives, uh, which of them actually work or don't work in terms of predicting coral cover and or the coral community and its ability to stay intact over time. Um, in the absence of that, uh, you are stuck with a, the difficulty of making decisions. 
And in such a case, you might do the intelligent thing of creating a portfolio of sanctuaries where you distribute your effort may, maybe evenly or some way weightedly among those three options. And here you can see these would be some of those three or four options, uh, depending on the method used. You could decide, okay, well, we'll, we'll focus some of our efforts on, on, um, on um, avoidance and others on resistance and others on recovery in order that whatever turns out to be strongest will at least have our bases covered. And while that, that is a good early entry approach to this problem, uh, a better approach is if you can actually figure out which models are actually doing the best at predicting um, the future states of reef and then focus on those. And in principle, we should continue to learn uh, and compete these ideas against one another in order that we can ultimately come up with uh, more, uh, weighing our effort more appropriately to those areas that are most likely to survive best into the future. Um, note going forward that um, I'm, I'm presenting some of the papers that are recently published and for those students that are keen to dive into the literature, I suggest you check, check the references below. Time won't allow me to go into a lot of detail on any of these issues, but I thought it'd be important here to uh, give an example of, of a model about future predictions about coral reefs based on the different types of modeling approaches. And here I'm comparing a threshold model, which is a model of mortality for corals when thresholds are passed in, in 2050. Um, and then I'll compare that with what I call a variability model, but it's an empirical model where I examine 14 variables associated with coral, and based on the best model, uh, I predict uh, the coral cover in 2020, which is about 35%, and then we predict it in 2050 um, based on how those variables are predicted to change by the global climate model into the future. And you can see from this graph, there are very large differences in coral cover in the Western Indian Ocean. These are the cumulative number of uh, cells in the Indian Ocean. There are about 10,000 plus uh, um, 6.25 square kilometer cells that have coral reefs in them. This is the distribution of those cells uh, in terms of the cumulative frequency, in terms of the predicted coral cover in 2020 and then in 2015 based on the different scenarios. And you can see that the, the th threshold model has a very dire predictions for coral reefs. That is basically 90% of the reefs uh, will have coral cover less than 25% in 2050. But the predictions are much less dire for the um, empirical model, where we uh, see that uh, some things are, are important, such as uh, fisheries restrictions, that if you increase fisheries restrictions in 2050, you'll get a, a considerable improvement on coral cover, and that's because currently uh, restricted fisheries areas, whether closures or gear restricted areas, generally have about 10% higher coral cover than those areas without those restrictions. So if those are implemented in the future, coral cover is quite good uh, and doesn't change quite as much as expected. And also if people embrace the carbon reduction uh, carbon emission reduction scenario, the 2.6 scenario, you'll also see that the conditions in the future are considerably better for corals. So this gives us some hope that for better conditions in the future, but that hope is dependent on how well uh, this empirical or variability model does in, in predicting corals now and in the future. One approach to finding sanctuaries is to look for where models overlap. So in this case of the threshold and the variability model, if you plot them against each other for the two different scenarios, you can see a lot of scatter, but there are actually locations where the two models predict um, similar outcomes. And so if you're looking for areas, say, with greater than 25% coral cover in 2050, you can find places that both models predict that. And that tends to be uh, the areas uh, in red here, um, which include uh, areas in the Mascarene Islands and into Madagascar and across to the African coastline along that equatorial current. So it's possible that those might be high priorities because in fact they have the elements of two models, quite different models, making very similar predictions in a case where in fact uh, the two models diverge considerably.
um, in terms of many of the other locations. So again, it would be good to know which of these models is better at predicting coral cover, but in the absence of that, we can look at the overlap as one way to identify sanctuaries. Another approach is to not just look at these environmental variables and their predictions into the future, but look at some other important elements of coral reefs. In this case, I've added coral diversity uh, based on my studies of coral diversity in these specific areas and identify where environmental exposure is low, where there's high levels of avoidance in principle, and then when there's high diversity. And those areas with low exposure and high diversity are marked in red here, and they show Mauritius is, is one of those areas, and particularly uh, northern Madagascar, but also particularly the area between Mozambique and southern Kenya, and then uh, the border regions of Kenya and Tanzania, where we currently have a, uh, a climate refuge project. So the idea here is to, to assume that coral diversity is a good thing and that it's a measure of, of basically avoidance of environmental stress. So you have another indicator uh, in rather than just coral cover alone as an indicator of where these sanctuaries are. So this is another approach uh, that we're using. So if we look at Mauritius, um, although it might be identified by some metrics as a sanctuary, we also know there's a lot of uh, repeated thermal stress occurring, particularly since about 2008 in Mauritius. And in many cases, um, the threshold for bleaching is quite low in Mauritius, one of the lowest in the world, because it's a temperate area and you can get coral bleaching to occur as low as 27.5 degrees centigrade, whereas in much of the rest of the tropical world it's as high as 31. So the corals are not as adapted to warm water as they are in other areas. So we've had these frequent bleaching events over time and the results have been losses of coral cover that's been reported in the national uh, coral monitoring studies. Uh, but many of those monitoring studies are using growth forms and not biodiversity so less is known about what's happening to the biodiversity in these areas. Another thing is that if you look at the mortality of coral over time, uh, you'll notice that it's, it tends to be patchy. It's not a uniform loss. There are some areas that have maintained coral cover at quite high levels over time, some that have lost it. And part of the reason for that is that the distribution of thermal stress around the island can be quite patchy. Uh, one of the things that we found was one of the strongest predictors of changes in coral cover and, and diversity was a thermal stress anomaly shown here at TSA. The rarity of those, the thermal stress anomalies was actually one of the strongest predictors of changes in the coral community. And you can see that your marine park, Blue Bay, was actually one of the areas that received the highest uh, thermal stress anomalies. Here you're looking at cumulative frequency such that there were quite a few large thermal anomalies in Blue Bay and less so in other areas. So these anomalies vary around the island. And Mauritius is particularly important because you have a small microcosm. You have a, lee, a windward side where the currents hit the coastline with their own conditions and you have uh, a leeward side which is more protected from currents and they, it creates a natural laboratory for understanding what might create resistance and or recovery of corals along this island. In principle you have a little uh, uh, um, limited area field study to look at these factors. And so originally in, in 2004 when we first came here we used this natural laboratory to ask uh, what might be the impacts of coral uh, thermal stress and the subsequent uh, response to corals in, in this uh, island. And one of the interesting findings was that it was actually the windward side of the island, particularly the southern windward side, that seemed to experience the worst bleaching. And that, in many ways, is not necessarily intuitive because in that area there's good current flow, the conditions for coral growth are good, but in fact, what we found was during thermal stress events, the conditions changed uh, more dramatically compared to background conditions. So you get these acute deviations away from mean conditions, and it's that deviation away from mean conditions that creates stress for the corals. Whereas when you go more to the north and the leeward side of the island, those areas have been experiencing more variable conditions over time, and when they get these acute events, they're more adapted to uh, 
those particular acute events. And so in many cases, you find those leeward areas are actually doing better than the windward areas. This map of Mauritius shows you in the center of the map the distribution of currents. And you can see the strongest currents in the south and, and the east and the weakest in the north and west. And this, uh, this corresponds pretty closely to the acuteness of the temperature of stress, more acute in the south and less acute in the, in the, in the north because of this, um, this, the currents and then how they change during these stressful events. They often slow down considerably. You get doldrum conditions and what used to have current flow is no longer has good current flow. The temperatures rise and corals that were used to living in this benign environment suddenly are stressed. So what you can see, if you look at the red dots, these are areas that lost a high number of species, almost some of them as much as 90% of the species were lost, and that these are located on the southern part of Mauritius, including uh, the marine park in Blue Bay. So in many of those areas, you can see high coral cover, but it's art largely tabular acropora, and many of the other genera have disappeared due to the stress. And so we found that, in fact, a number of corals have actually disappeared from those study sites over time, three species in particular that I'll talk a little bit about more about later. Uh, and whereas you're up in the north, you have generally fairly low losses of species. So coral cover and species losses need not do very, uh, need not be the same. It's also, if you look at sort of the predictions of sanctuaries in Mauritius, you can see the variability model predicts a lot of Mauritius as, as, a, as a sanctuary, which is simply not the case. And the threshold model um, considers mostly the southern leeward side as a, as, a, as a sanctuary, but in fact that's not very accurate as well. If anything tends to be accurate, it would be the north and west. So the problem here that you can see is that we have models that are not that good at predicting, but it depends on what you're looking at. They're not, the, the models in these cases were for predicting coral cover, whereas the data on the left is actually numbers of species. So you could have a model that predicts coral cover reasonably well. Possibly the variability model is saying, well, coral cover is gonna do all right in general in Mauritius, but the empirical data is showing you can have major losses of, of, of biodiversity, and particularly in the southern region. So this creates some of the issues, but why Mar Mauritius is interesting from a scientific point of view is the laboratory, natural laboratory of effect is that we've been able to ask these questions and many of the answers here will help you solve some of the problems more broadly because this sort of leeward, windward, current, high current, low current, chronic acute stress repeats itself throughout the world and Mauritius we have some of the data to, to test some of these ideas. So as I said Mauritius is losing species we're hoping to make people aware of that um, through some of these, um, you know, these announcements and policy briefs. Um, this is an example where we show a few of the species that are, seem to be they're not, uh, not being found or may be disappearing. Uh, coral on the top there is called Herpolitha. Um, it disappeared out of our sites, but fortunately we've seen it since then in, in other sites. So we know it's still in Mauritius. It's just that it, it seems its numbers are probably reducing because in the sites we selected, it, it, it disappeared over a 15 year period. So that's another conservation concern is where are these corals that are disappearing? Where are they located in, in Mauritius? And is there anything we can do to improve, improve their survival into the future? The other coral below it is called Pleurogyra. Again, a very interesting coral. Um, disappeared out of our study sites, but we, we saw a colony of it in, uh, in uh, uh, an area in, in the northeast of, uh, of, of Mauritius. So it still exists, and that, that's a hopeful sign. What you can see so far is that the issues are complicated, and the science is moving forward, and the learning is occurring, but is in many cases slow. Probably the original focus on avoidance sanctuaries uh, may, may, may be fo focusing on areas that may be uh, uh, sensitive to catastrophes when these uh, 
conditions change dramatically, much like they did in the southern and eastern part of Mauritius over the last uh, 10, 10 years or so. And um, that maybe what we should be looking at is more uh, resistance and recovery sanctuaries, and that these may be located in areas where there's intermediate levels of thermal stress. Um, that they get uh, some low chronic stress, so they're exposed to stress. So when acute stress comes along, they, they, they can resist it to some extent and possibly recover well. And if you look at um, some of the empirical data in these figures below, this is showing coral cover as a function of cumulative uh, heat stress. And what you can see in many cases, they're hump-shaped relationships. That is, they, coral cover is doing fairly well where there is some level of, of thermal anomaly. So it may be that this idea can create this new set of, of sanctuaries. Those are the resistance recovery sanctuaries. And those complemented with the avoidance sanctuaries may give us different types of sanctuaries and different types of locations. And, and, um, and then again, it's having a portfolio of a mix of those may be, may be important. But we need to identify avoidance sanctuaries that, in fact, are actually avoiding uh, stress as opposed to just delaying the stress to some future period when catastrophes can occur. So I think we're making progress, and now uh, our plan is over the next few years is to identify these types of sanctuaries and then give them priority in terms of the conservation efforts uh, that we promote uh, with the governments and NGOs that we work with. Uh, I'd like to move on to the second topic of sustainable fishing. Um, this is important for the status of reefs in terms of both maintaining coral cover and coral growth, but it's also critical for food security and even for biodiversity, as I'll show later. Um, one of the main things I do as a conservation biologist is count fish underwater, identify them to the species, measure their sizes, estimate their stock biomass or weights, and this gives me some indication of what the status of a fishery is. And this is independent of the fishery itself, so it tells me more information about um, how fish as species are doing. One of the things I can tell you I notice a lot is the lack of carnivores, especially large carnivores. And these are two examples of groups that are, are largely disappearing out of heavily fished reefs in the region. Uh, groupers, the large ones, are, are very difficult to see these days. There are groupers, but they're the small-bodied ones that are often less than 30 centimeters. Sweet Lips on the right is another example of a group that is, um, in many cases, disappearing. Um, in our region, you might find them in parks, but outside of parks, they become very rare. And in Mauritius, um, they're quite rare. I've seen a few individuals of some species, but there are some species I've never seen. And I assume that is due to their sensitivity to certain types of fishing gear. So we're beginning to see losses, and many of them may be even threatened with extinction. Uh, but not that much is known about them. Not a lot of information is, is collected on them, so our knowledge about them is somewhat limited. Uh, to enter into this subject, I just wanted to show uh, the outcomes of a recent paper, which effectively looked at the rising effort on the left and the declining catch per unit effort in the Mozambique Channel. This is what is called catch re reconstruction, which is an attempt by a group of academics to um, evaluate how fishing effort and catch per unit effort has changed over time. And what you can see here is, uh, you know, a rising effort and then the declining CPU. This would be expected. But in many cases, the catch per unit effort uh, in many areas, is particularly after the introduction of motorized uh, boats, is very low, often at what I, you might call replacement level. That is, the amount of energy you consume is not that different from the amount of en energy you produce. That's not a good location to be in a fishery. You need a net profit of energy. And in many cases, you're seeing that that's not the case. So in many cases, there's a lot of poverty associated with fishing because of this lack of net, net profitability in terms of energy and income. I just want to remind uh, people unfamiliar with fisheries that the basis of a lot of fisheries um, analysis and modeling is based on this, what's called the growth of the logistic yield model, which is what happens to a population 
as it recovers from a disturbance like fishing. And this uh, model is often a good indicator of where uh, your yields are maximized, usually at some level around half of the maximum uh, stock levels. And so in order to understand the status of a fishery, you often have to know what this um, maximum level is, or what's often called K, or in this case, uh, K, but oftentimes called pristine biomass or B sub naught. And that's not really well known for coral reefs, at least until I started working on it. Um, most people didn't know what the maximum biomass was because in many cases, almost all the areas were already fished and there was no records of pre-fishing conditions. So I spent a good part of my career trying to figure out um, what this K or B sub naught level was based on reconstruction of fish biomass in uh, marine reserves, areas protected from all forms of fishing. And because the reserves are of different ages, you can piece together uh, or reconstruct what biomass might change like over time. Here you can see the results of some of this uh, field work where you can see the recovery of fish biomass with the age of closures and what you'll notice is that at about 20 years um, the fish biomass levels at around a thousand kilograms per hectare and therefore you now have a good estimate of K and uh, this also gives you an estimate of productivity because the rate is in, contained within this information. So you now have um, two very important variables to estimate uh, the status of reefs and, and, and yields. The other graphs are just to show you that if you use data that is from low compliance closures or from small uh, uh, or young closures, you'll find that um, some of the relationships are not so good and that, that, that makes sense in the sense that if you not, there's not high compliance on the no fishing, you won't get the same responses. So it's important to use data coming from areas greater than five square kilometer of closure and it's important to look at these older closures, particularly those that are older than 20 years to make sure these values have leveled. Another thing you can do with this data is um, look at the different categories of fish because this is important for estimating yields. Uh, the total biomass of fish is, is interesting in terms of ecological status, but in terms of fisheries, there's a lot of fish that is uh, either too small or unedible or unpreferred, and, and therefore knowing that information is important. In particularly important is the target biomass. That's the fish that we target in fisheries. And you can see here that uh, that target biomass is um, almost half the level of the total fish biomass. And that, that's where we're most interested in um, at measuring productivity. These are um, fish that you know could be sold in markets and, um, and not just those that are used for um, the purposes of, uh, of, uh, of eating locally. Uh, and this is extremely important in Mauritius, mostly because there is fairly high biomass of fish on, on many of the fished reefs in particularly the lagoons in Mauritius because of the damselfish stegastes. This damselfish reaches 20 or 30 centimeters. It's a fairly large body. It's one of the largest damselfishes in the world, but people don't fish it and it's not really considered an, an edible uh, product and certainly not sold. So you can get very different views of the fishery and the status of, of reefs in Mauritius, whether you include the damselfish stegastes or not. For example, here you can see that uh, actually, gear street areas have more biomass than marine reserves, but that's because of the stegaces. If you remove that, you'll find uh, the fishable biomass is, is now quite a bit different, and particularly the target uh, biomass uh, is almost a fourth of what uh, the, the leveling value of around 500 and, and, um, and 40 kilograms per hectare. So that tells you that Recent reefs are overfished and you're losing a considerable amount of productivity and income because of it. A nice development in, uh, in spatial modeling is the ability to predict stocks if you can know something about the variables that predict stocks. So 
um, if you know important things like the depth or the time it takes for fishermen to travel or the management status, sea surface temperature, reef area, net primary productivity, the country that the, that the stock is located in, you can actually make pretty good estimates of what stock levels are like in areas where you haven't actually measured stocks. So you can predict them based on these predictive models that are based on the empirical data. So in all the areas that I've counted stocks, I can now come up with this predictive model, which is shown here, which is uh, predicting pretty well stocks. And then that allows me to extrapolate to very broad regions and tell you what the stock, expected stock levels are like. You can see in the bottom left by country that, you know, after you count for all the various variables, there are countries with generally high stocks and countries with low stocks. You can see Kenya and Reunion among the lowest, uh, and Mauritius not doing much better. Um, so uh, this gives us a, an ability to avoid stock assessment. It's costly, but to give us some estimates of the status of, of stocks in each of these countries, and that makes us now able to start predicting a variety of issues such as yields and income on very large scales. Consequently, you can see that um, we can now model uh, stocks on very large spatial scales. And since we know recovery, we can also model recovery rates. Uh, and that gives us also an indication of yields. And what I can tell you is that in many areas with these stocks below the 500 kilograms, Per hectare level, people are losing a lot of money due to the fact that they are not um, uh, maximizing their yield. And I made an estimate for the East African eco region, and it's uh, seventy-six million dollars per year. And I, what my guess is that Mauritius—it's uh, a much smaller area, but you're probably losing as much as eight thousand dollars or so per square kilometer. Um, of reef because of low production. So there's consequences for not managing fisheries, um, not just for biodiversity, but actually income, unemployment, and, and, and food security. So of course, what can we do about it is, 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 is important as evaluating the problem, and I'll argue that there are solutions at various scales. At the scale, small scale of the fishermen, this is one example of a solution we've worked on, which is to put gates and traps, that is to allow the smallest fish or the narrow-bodied fish to escape. And on the left is one that was created by an artisan who makes traps, but also on the right you can see we've been giving gates to fishermen and they can uh, sew these gates into the trap so that the smallest fish get out. Sort of at the meso scale is something we've discussed before as marine reserves, that these uh, smallish marine reserves, in this case uh, a six square kilometer marine reserve, what we found was that over a 24 year period, yields were very constant, whereas in areas with gear restrictions, uh, the yields slowly decayed over time. So indicating that the gear restrictions were not sufficient for maintaining sustainability. So having 30% of your nearshore area in moderate sized closures may be one way to solve this overfishing problem. And finally, there are these large-scale policy solutions, um, in particular improved incentives for, for employment and, and retiring policies. Uh, we studied this in, in the region some time ago, and what we found that in Mauritius was that a lot of fishermen um, don't want to retire or exit the fishery because of the subsidies they get from the government. So what you've done is maintained uh, effort above the, the optimal levels through policies that uh, don't promote retirement or don't employ alternative employ employment. So the, these kind of large-scale policies are, are viable solutions. They may be politically difficult, but in fact, they're, in the long run, they, they can help solve these problems. And then finally, I'd like to end this section by reminding people that one of the things we found very important is that people's willingness to participate in fisheries restrictions is dependent heavily on the status of the governance. And so if you look at people's governance, um, the way they scale governance, it often correlates very strongly with the way they, they support restrictions. And it's possible to look at government governance institutions, that's in the middle panel here,
and to find which uh, institutions are strong and weak and to help build those institutions that are weak in order to improve governance. And in many cases, you'll find in weak fisheries, some of the common problems are that they don't monitor their resources or they don't monitor their resource users. In many cases, they have conflicts with their neighbors. And thirdly, they often don't feel that there's a, a, a proper balance between cost and benefits. So if you can build those three aspects of the institutional um, parts of fisheries, you can help to overcome some of the weaknesses that lead to, to weak restrictions. The final section of this talk is about endemics and biodiversity. Mauritius is a unique location because of its island nature. It's isolated and many species can evolve independently here and create their own species over evolutionary time and that, that is the case. Um, in many cases, these are often small-bodied individuals with limited larval dispersal, and in many cases, they're damselfishes. But there are cases such as this uh, black-banded hogfish that is also an endemic to this area and also probably a commercially important species uh, that may be threatened by, that, by the limited uh, population size and, and, and isolation in, in Mauritius. This species in particular is probably a commercial species. I don't think it's commercially viable anymore, but uh, because I've only seen three in, in, in all, all my dives in Mauritius, but that it is present and more needs to be known about its status in order that it doesn't go locally extinct through, through neglect. Uh, re a survey some time ago identified uh, the Mascarene Islands uh, as the fourth most threatened yeah. reef fish fauna due to the isolated nature of the reefs here. And in many cases, this is due to these small bodied uh, fishes, damsel fishes in particular, um, where you get uh, unique species often formed by the isolation of species that are not able to disperse over large areas. So we made this a focus of one of our conservation projects in Mauritius where we work closely with the University Reef Conservation, the Fisheries Department, and, and dive industry to do a citizen science evaluation of the status of some of these endemics. We focused on six endemic fish and six uh, corals that, if not endemic, are rare and mostly limited to this area. The results were quite interesting. Um, there are some good news. Uh, for instance, the Mauritian clownfish seems to do, be doing fairly well. We found 93 in 119 dives. Um, I don't think that's particularly abundant, but at least they are present on the island in, in fair numbers. Um, so there were a number of, about four of the six species that we looked at were uh, had reasonable numbers. There is some bad news in that two of the species that we uh, selected were not seen uh, by the citizen science divers in the 119 dives. I had seen the Creole damselfish in 2004 in some shallow lagoons, but I haven't seen it again, and uh, we're very concerned about that species. Uh, on the right is the Mauritian damselfish, which is a a uh, very recently recorded species by Allen in 1991. And um, that species has not, I haven't seen, nor has it been recorded in any of the diver surveys. So we're very concerned about these two species and um, whether they're still present or not. So going forward, we hope to continue to look for these species, identify if they still exist, where they're located, and determine whether there is conservation uh, need for conservation of these species. Another thing about this survey was that the distribution of damselfish is not uniform around the island. There are some, some endemics that live in the lagoon and others that live off the reef edge. And more importantly is that most of the endemics exist also in the north, similar to the better conditions for coral that I discussed earlier. A lot of the endemics tend to be on the north and, and west side. And that may partly be due to more observa more observers, uh, but it, in many cases we try and account for that in other areas by sampling in areas not experienced 
that divers don't dive in, but nonetheless, it seems like the distribution is focused uh, in, in the north. In many cases, that seems to be a good thing because these are often tourist areas and there should be a larger conservation ethic in this environment. And in fact, we did survey a large, nearly a thousand households to ask them about their their perceptions of endemics. And what you find is Mauritians are very supportive of protecting and conserving endemics. Uh, their views of the environment change from place to place a little bit, but there is a general perception that you know, the country should prioritize conserving endemics. I'd like to present some findings from an another study of the Western Indian Ocean and the biodiversity so we can put some of the local studies in Mauritius in context of the Western Indian Ocean. Uh, we've done a large-scale survey um, of coral genera and numbers of fish and six families in over a thousand sites uh, throughout the Western Indian Ocean. And our goal there was to see if we could make predictions for high diversity spots uh, throughout the region, including Mauritius. Uh, in order to do that, we developed a model for associations between observed riches as richness in environmental variables. So we collated probably all of the environmental variable information that you can get for the region. That includes um, water temperatures, uh, human demographic factors such as uh, market locations, um, some estimates of fishing, uh, marine protected areas, uh, and a lot of uh, other environmental variables like light and temperature and salinity, etc. We used a machine learning statistical mes method called boosted regression trees to look for the relationships. And then we um, looked at, tried to create the best models to make the predictions with the empirical data and then use those model, environmental variable model, to make predictions in areas for which there is no biodiversity data. This is the location of the actual study sites, the empirical data, give you some idea of the coverage of the sites, and it's quite wide, including Mauritius. Um, and this is the basis for them making the environmental variable model based on the um, environmental variables I discussed. This would be an example of some of the variables used in the model and how well they fit, in this case, the um, biodiversity of fish. It also shows that we looked at two different models um, to include as many variables as possible without eliminating them for arbitrary reasons. And then in the end, we use the same. We combine these two models to make the predictions. But you can hit, see here that the top predictor of biodiversity of fish is uh, the biomass of fish, which shows the importance of protecting fish biomass if you want to have biodiversity. But other variables, such as travel time to the location from the coastline, is important. So is the sea surface temperature, the net primary productivity, the country in which the, which the fish are located, um, a number of water flow or connectivity measurements as to in, inflow of, um, of, um, of currents into the area as, and their nearness to other sources, as well as things such as the distance to markets. These uh, variables are then used to pr make the predictions in cells uh, without any empirical data. And that's the... Then without going into too many further details, this is what the grid map would look like. And the red squares that you see would give an indication of the squares that would be predicted to have the top 20% of biodiversity for fish on the left, for corals in, in the mid, in middle, and then the combined fish and corals on the right. Uh, the important thing here is that you get probably three biodiversity centers in Mauritius for the combined fish and coral. There's slight differences between the fish and coral, but in general you get the east coast in Marburg area as one of the biodiversity cent centers and also the northeast and northwest sites as the high biodiversity centers. So we believe these are important locations for conservation and areas that Mauritians should think about ensuring their protection 
given that they're an island and biodiversity is isolated, it's important that um, the biodiversity, biodiversity that is there is protected. I want to finish the data part of this presentation by making people aware that uh, conservation and development are not often at, at, at odds, and that's particularly true of fish because there's um, often an increase in biodiversity as you approach this maximum sustained yield level of, um, of uh, 500 kilograms per hectare. This is shown in this slide here, and it turns out that Model B is probably the best uh, um, model of biodiversity and yield. And that's shown on the right with the data from many countries in the Indian Ocean that you have high biodiversity, you also have high yield production. So it's very possible to have them both, and one should not use arguments for uh, food security or um, economics uh, as a trade-off with biodiversity, because at least in fisheries, they're positively related. In, in conclusion, I want to remind the listeners that all of the solutions that uh, are presented here are are common solutions, that is, they are people getting together at various scales of human and organization and agreeing on how to manage resources in order that there's some optimization across different scales from the global to the local. That's very clear to most of us that look at climate change, you realize there's a global level issue here and you have to address it at that level, but it also has aspects of local commons problems such as I shown in fisheries here. And that is that if you better manage your fisheries, some of the impacts of the global uh, effects are not as large uh, as they might be. Again, fisheries management, you've seen case, uh, the, the solutions I offer here require a variety of local, mesoscale, and large-scale policy solutions. And in many cases, there's, these are also issues of trade and issues of donor support. In many cases, these trade and donor support uh, programs are not, not supporting uh, sustainable management in fisheries, and this is a problem that has to be solved at multiple scales. Biodiversity, again, um, Mauritius has its local endemics. This is a local problem, but if they're lost here, it's a global problem in the sense that we're losing species that took uh, millions of years for the planet to produce. So all of these uh, solutions need human organization, getting commitments, and working at the, uh, on commons problems. It should be obvious to all of you now that uh, the scale of the work that we're doing re requires a lot of collaboration, both within countries and, uh, and between countries. And in Mauritius, we're particularly uh, grateful to the role that the many institutions shown here have done to help us. Uh, and they run, as you can see, from very local organizations such as the diver industry to national institutions such as the Ministry of Oceans, um, and as well the uh, educational institutions um, such as University of Mauritius. We're gra very grateful for their participation. It's been a pleasure working with you all, and we hope this work can continue into the future. And I'll end my talk there. It's been my pleasure uh, speaking to you. Uh, I hope this was useful to you. Uh, there's a lot of information in the references in the papers, but I'm available for your question and answers. Many thanks for the opportunity to speak to you.